Dr. Mubatahar completed his dermatology training at the University of Alberta before undergoing fellowship training in dermatologic surgery in Los Angeles and Santa Monica, California. While in the U.S., he was on faculty at the University of Southern California and also lectured at UCLA. Um, hey, Dr. Tahar, how are you doing today? Good afternoon, very well, thank you. Great. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for agreeing to appear on our MediViews.com webcast today. Um, thank you for the invitation. For sure. Um, so, as we know, the topic of our uh, webcast today is non melanoma skin cancer. Um, and so, I guess I'd like to just start out our conversation today by just asking you a very broad question, uh, which is what is skin cancer? Well, when we use the term skin cancer, we're simply referring to uh, an abnormal growth. Um, on the skin, usually there's a certain cell type in the skin that's growing abnormally, leading to a, a cancer. Okay, um, and so sort of, how does the skin tumor come about developing, or what what processes go on to lead to a tumor? Well, there there are many factors that lead to skin cancers. One of the more well known ones are the effects of, of sunlight, the ultraviolet rays in sunlight, that lead to uh, mutations in the, the the skin, and that leads to um, an abnormal growth of skin. Um, there are other factors such as genetic, um, there can be um, you know, drugs that um, compromise your immune system and that contribute to you forming skin cancer. So there are in fact many reasons why a person might um, form a skin cancer. Okay, great. Now, um, are there different forms of skin cancer? or There are actually s several different types of uh, skin cancer and um, I mean, if you listed every tumor type, there are, there are many to list. Uh, the thing is, there are different types of cell in the skin, and each cell can give rise to different types of skin cancer. And so one simple way of putting it is you have um, melanoma skin cancers, non-melanoma skin cancers, and then there's a grab bag of other rare tumors. Okay. Um, and so under the sort of category of uh, non-melanoma skin cancers, what, when we think of those, are there sort of um, like a few main categories or main tumor types that... The two main types of non-melanoma skin cancers would be uh, basal cell carcinoma as well as squamous cell carcinoma. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and um, so I guess these together as a group, how common are the non-melanoma skin cancers in society? As a group uh, in North America, there's approximately a about a million or so people in uh, Canada and the U.S. that uh, develop non-melanoma skin cancer. So certainly not a rare rare event, so mm -hmm. it, uh, it, it's, it's more than a million a year. Okay, wow. Um, and out of the uh, basal cell or squamous cell carcinoma, which one is more uh, sort of prevalent? For the uh, normal, healthy population, basal cell carcinomas are uh, usually more frequent. It okay. could be a ratio of for every four or five basal cells, you get one squamous cell carcinoma. Okay, um, and so uh, are there certain segments of the population that are sort of more prone uh, to developing these non-melanoma skin cancers? There are certain uh, risk factors um, uh, and uh, patient types that uh, would increase um, the chance of a skin cancer. Uh, for example, uh, patients uh, with uh, fairer skin types, patients that have had increased exposure to sunlight. Okay. Um, there are groups of patients where there's uh, a strong family history of, um, of, of skin cancer, they have to be more careful. And then um, there are immunosuppressed patients, uh, for example, organ transplant recipients okay. that are on uh, medications, but they're at higher risk as well. Okay, um, so so if you have any type of co uh, a compromised immune system, it kind of puts you at a higher risk of... of that, that can, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, um, and now what about, um, like, you hear a lot of talk about this in the media, um, do artificial tanning beds uh, increase your risk of developing? They do. Um, artificial uh, tanning beds expose you to, um, you know, unnecessary levels of uh, ultraviolet radiation, mm -hmm. and uh, that is a well-known risk factor, and so certainly for those patients that are regular um, visitors to tanning booths, they are putting themselves at a higher risk for developing skin cancer. Okay. Um, now, uh, can people from any age group uh, develop a non-melanoma skin cancer, or are there certain age groups that are sort of more prone? Generally speaking, this is um, a, con a condition you get um, more in your later years. Um, the typical uh, non-melanoma skin cancer patient usually is um, perhaps uh, in their uh, 30s, 40s, or 50s. It's not so common in children. Okay. Certainly there are cases of um, 
young children getting these, but that's the exception. Okay. Um, so now, uh, as a dermatologist, um, uh, if you're doing a, a skin checkup on a patient, um, what sort of features or, or what kind of an appearance of a skin lesion would lead you to suspect that you might be dealing with either basal cell or squamous cell? You know, in, in the simplest uh, explanation I can give, and this is what I usually tell my patients, is you know, I'm looking out for spots that are just behaving funny. They're bleeding, perhaps they're crusting, uh, a wound that's not healing. Um, these are signs that something's not right in the skin and that the, it should be investigated for, for skin cancer. So in summary, I'd say watch out for spots that are growing, bleeding, and crusting abnormally. Okay. Um, and if, I mean, for these skin cancers, um, does it, do they just sort of like pop up out of nowhere or are there sometimes like warning signs or um, sort of lesions that present before the actual cancer? Uh, yeah, the skin cancers, um, the one advantage we have in dealing with them is they, they generally, generally speaking, they do grow slowly and, um, you know, you, you might see a, a, a small lesion at first that's gradually growing. Um, and then bleeding or crusting, so they do start out in a small as a small spot. Again, generally speaking, and then they continue to to get bigger. So, again, looking out for those uh, those um, features of an unusual spot on the body is always a good idea. Okay. Um, now, uh, so say someone did have a, a basal cell carcinoma that went unchecked, um, you know, for a long period of time. What are the potential consequences of this? Basal cell carcinomas um, are, are locally destructive uh, tumors in that they, they grow slowly. Again, general, these are all you know, general, general terms. They grow very slowly and they continue to grow deeper and wider into the skin and the structures below. Thankfully, they're not the type of cancers that very quickly spread to other parts of the body and are life-threatening. As they grow deeper, they can run into important structures like nerves, blood vessels, muscle, cartilage, bone, and that's when you start getting into trouble with um, with uh, aggressive variants of uh, basal cell carcinoma. And, okay. of and of course, there are very rare cases where they do spread. So okay. they can spread. And what about uh, for squamous cell carcinoma? Similarly speaking, uh, most squamous cell carcinomas are just locally destructive, um, mm -hmm. uh, causing local. Um, problems on the skin. However, compared to basal cell carcinomas, squamous cell carcinomas have an increased potential to metastasize um, to other parts of the body or to local uh, regional lymph nodes. Um, but again, generally speaking, they're localized to the skin and they can be destructive. Okay, great. Now, um, is there anything that patients can do to help prevent uh, the occurrence of these types of skin cancers? I think education is always uh, uh, important. Um, the patient should be aware of what to look out for, uh, those features that I've mentioned. Um, they should take measures to prevent um, increasing their risk factors for, um, ba for basal or squamous cell carcinoma, therefore of, um, uh, avoiding uh, you know, excessive sun exposure, sunburns, uh, tanning beds. These are all features that help um, uh, prevent um, skin cancers. As far as sun protection goes, you know, wearing sunscreen, uh, avoiding the most intense hours of sun exposure, um, wearing uh, sun protective hats, clothing. These are all these are all uh, lifestyle changes that uh, can help um, prevent um, uh, your increasing your risk for skin cancer. Okay, great. So now, um, you know, once someone is diagnosed uh, with one of these forms of skin cancer, what types of treatment options are available? Treatment options for uh, non-melanoma skin cancers uh, vary. The reason is um, it, it all depends on how early your cancer is um, diagnosed, mm -hmm. uh, and it can also depend on the subtype of skin cancer. Now we've spoken about squamous versus basal cell carcinomas. Both have subtypes that can be very superficial, and therefore these are the subtypes that uh, you don't need extensive procedures to cut them up, to, to cure them. Um, for example, a very superficial basal or squamous cell carcinoma can uh, be treated with um, very uh, superficial scraping of the skin or burning of, of the skin with electrocautery um, or even creams, uh, topical creams to help burn off um, uh, certain types of skin cancers. 
On the other hand, if you have a more aggressive, infiltrative, invasive skin cancer, you may need more extensive treatments, including uh, surgical excisions or specialized surgical excisions called Mohs micrographic surgery. And of course, for the most uh, aggressive skin cancers that have invaded deep into uh, structures below, uh, the worst case scenarios may need um, radiation therapy uh, or uh, chemo chemotherapy okay. to deal with that. And um, so I understand that um, you do quite a bit of the uh, most micrographic surgery. And I was just wondering um, if you could uh, touch a little bit on how does this surgical procedure differ from, from sort of regular surgical excision, if you will, of a skin tumor? Sure. Mohs micrographic surgery, um, first of all, it's named after uh, Dr. Frederick Mohs, who was the uh, pioneer in uh, developing this procedure. Essentially, what Mohs micrographic surgery allows you to do is to track the tumor roots um, and completely remove the cancer before you reconstruct the defect. In a standard excision, uh, the surgeon uh, makes a very uh, careful assessment of going a certain width and depth so as to try to remove the skin cancer. Mm -hmm. However, um, there isn't assurance that they have complete um, knowledge of the margins of the, uh, the, uh, the tumor, whether they've completely excised it. Uh, whereas in micrographic surgery, I excise a tumor and um, the patient waits for the excised tissue uh, to be made into slides, okay. uh, which usually takes anywhere from half an hour to even a couple of hours if it's a very big case. And then those slides are studied. Um, I would study them myself and assess 100% of the margin. And only if, I'm, uh, only if I can um, ascertain that all the roots are removed, I would then proceed with reconstructing the patient's defect. On the other hand, if the study of the, uh, the slides shows that there's still some roots left, I can come back and because we orient the tissue, I know exactly which direction the cancer is um, growing and uh, further tissue can be uh, excised, so you only take out what you need to before okay. you repair the, uh, the skin. Okay, well that's very interesting. Um, now I, my last question uh, would be, once a patient has had um, a appropriate treatment uh, for their basal cell or squamous cell carcinoma, um, what are the chances that the tumor might recur or show up again? This also, um, the answer to that question also depends on um, the subtype, how aggressive it is, and what treatment was used. Um, as an example, again, if it was a very superficial type of basal or squamous cell, um, superficial procedures like um, uh, excision and curatage, um, electrocauterization, there's an excellent chance of cure. Um, on the other hand, if you have a very aggressive subtype of cancer, for example, say a desmal plastic uh, variant of basal cell carcinoma, if you were to simply scrape that off the skin, there's a good chance that it may come back. Um, okay. There's a possibility it may come back because the roots are a little more infiltrative. In that case, more um, aggressive types of therapy, such as wide excision or Mohs micrographic surgery, um, would be preferred, and that would decrease the chance of recurrence. So recurrence depends on the cancer subtype and the treatment. Okay, and so now besides um, the chance of recurrence of the tumor, are there any other potential long-term complications that might persist after treatment? Well, after a successful treatment of a skin cancer, um, one um, complication that uh, a patient may have to deal with is there's always some degree of scarring that may be left over, whether you scrape a cancer or do a, a very nice reconstruction. There's always a chance that there's a little bit of um, change in color or, or surface texture, so that's something to keep in mind when you have your cancer treatment. Okay, great. Um, well, Dr. Tonner, I'd like to thank you uh, very much for this very informative discussion on non melanoma skin cancers, uh, and I hope that our uh, viewers found it as interesting as I did. Awesome. Thank, thank, you thank, for, you. thank you for inviting me. Thank you, no problem.